Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, a.k.a. The Doctor, and I'm here on Zoom with uh, my partner in crime, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And uh, Ben, the engineer, is with us. And you may notice this looks a little different. Usually we're in studio, but today our man, Roberto, was unable to get us in the studio. He wasn't feeling well, so we're just going to try this from home. Uh, but we're super excited. We have a very special guest, very acclaimed guest. Author and investigative reporter, Douglas Sentry, is with us. And he is a New York Times bestselling author. He's written some great books about crime, especially books that our audience would be interested in uh, that we'll talk about a little later. Books about El Chapo, books about the Italian mafia, books about African-American crime. And uh, but we're especially here to talk to him about his newest book, uh, The Last Boss of Brighton. And this is our first episode that's going to address the Russian mafia. So we're pretty excited about this. Doug, thanks for joining us. Thank you guys for having me on. Original Gangsters is a great title for a podcast, which I wish I thought of it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We, yeah, we appreciate that. And um, OG's taking over the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Before we get um, uh, heavy into the into the to the book, I mean, what? I mean, obviously, you're an acclaimed crime writer. You've written about other crime groups. What inspired you to take on this story, like specifically the story of Boris and and the Russian mafia? Uh, money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there always people ask me, where do you get your ideas? I said, it's a business deal. What happened was there's a film company out in L.A., uh, Hollywood, called Morgan Creek Entertainment. People know it. Ace Ventura, a whole bunch of things. And they acquired Boris's life rights in 2018-ish when he was still out on bail for a, a, a crazy murder for hire. And they thought they'll do a limited series, you know, a Sopranos type, maybe, uh, maybe not multi-seasons. But they said, well, everybody's looking for IP, right? Everybody's looking for what do we base this on? So I get a call from an agent who says, do you know who Boris Neyfeld is? And I said, yeah, I heard the name Brighton Beach. He was in my office a few minutes ago, and he's the scariest freaking guy I've ever seen in my life. Do you want to meet him? And I said, sure. I, I mean, I've met a lot of gangsters. So uh, I agreed to do it under the proviso that it was an honest book, and he had no approval of what the content would be. I didn't write it to be a TV series. And the more, I don't know, you've got, you know, Scott's also an author and writer. You, you don't casually take on a subject and think you're going to fake your way through the details. I really had to immerse myself into this. So once I got to know Boris, he's an extremely interesting mix of charming and deadly. He's a lot of fun to hang out with. So we just started to hang out. We went to the, you know, drank some vodka, went to the banya to sweat it out and, I got to know his story. He's 73. Now he's 74. He just wanted to tell his story. And I mean, a lot of it was unfiltered, raw. I called bullshit when it was bullshit. I said, I, hey, Boris, I don't think that's the real version of the event. Uh, he's been convicted three times of, well, money laundering, racketeering, attempted murder in the States, had a prison stint in the, it's not really a gulag anymore, but in the Soviet times, a work camp, which was brutal. And uh, I mean, the only thing he's not been convicted of are, are the four murders he's suspected of. But if anybody wants to Google Boris Neyfeld and they see all these, you, you know, everybody knows the Russian prison tats tell you their story, their autobiography. He's got four skulls. You, you figure that out. But whenever I would ask him about the skulls, he would say, I mean, God punished him. <laughs> he did admit to the heroin trafficking and the cocaine trafficking. But yeah, I thought it was a fascinating, once I fell into it and realized my family came from the same part of what's called white Russia before the communists took over. They got to America. His family stayed. Some were killed in the Holocaust. So I kind of felt like, well, there but for the grace of God go ahead. I mean, these are Russian speaking people, but these are Jewish gangsters, essentially. Almost everybody in the book is Jewish. My family are Jewish from, from Russia. And, and the kind of connection, I don't know, I just started to see a kind of uh, sociological interest and then I realized there was nothing really accurate written on it, not to badmouth anybody else's book, but nobody really captured that Brighton Beach underworld faithfully and accurately to how they really speak and talk. And I took, I took that as a challenge. Now, I wrote this during the pandemic, so halfway through, I thought, what am I doing here? This is nuts. Like, I can't. He kept telling me, come to Odessa. Come. He was in Moscow for most of the writing of the book. I was like, I can't travel. I wanted to come and see where he was from and all that. But um yeah, I mean, it, it became a, a matter, I don't know if Scott's the same way, uh, curiosity. I was like, there's not, there's a lot of great books about the Italian mafia, a lot. I too really many, can't, too, many. Too, 
too many. And this, I mean, and uh, Galliotti, the guy in Britain who wrote the Vori, I mean, there are books, but Boris is not that Vori Zakoni. It's not, those are the thieves in law, you know, with the stars. This is different. These are the Russian Jewish speaking, or the Russian speaking Jews who got out of the Soviet Union. It's a very different phenomenon. And they really existed briefly, 70s, 80s, 90s. It's really, Brighton Beach is very safe now. There's not organized crime there. So I, I saw it as a period piece. I also, being Jewish, I love the stories of Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Lepke, Bokalter. And I thought, wow, my grandparents came over in that wave. This wave, it's almost like once upon a time in America, but in the 80s, same thing, fresh off the boat, go to a community, 40,000 strong in Brighton Beach, everybody's stealing, hustling, cheating, figuring out their way to come get out of the out of the bottom of the barrel where they were. So I don't know, it just it just material felt fresh and interesting. And once I got to know Boris, I, I got to confess, we had a lot of fun hanging out. <laughs> well, came I, back you know, I can speak. I can speak, you know, uh, in firsthand experience that a lot of gangsters are are fun to hang around. I mean, that's why they are able to accrue power because people want to be around them. There, there's a magnetism, but yeah, and it can be a it can be a lethal magnetism. And as a as a journalist, you always have to be weary of of blurred lines. And you know, I, I myself have been guilty or have been caught sometimes in letting those lines blur and, it, and it's been a um it's been you know it's it's you know you, you jump in the deep end of the ocean and you hope you can swim sometimes you well, might get uh, nipped by a shark hopefully you don't get eaten yeah you know the first book I, I wrote about gangsters I was in my 30s and I've written about Italian I mean I've been threatened by well Italian mob guys lawyer threatened me but it was like you right. know we know where exactly. we know where we know where you live we know where you live we know where you, we know where you live Doug <laughs> okay well you know okay great um but now I'm in my 50s so I know the I know the code I know how to hang out with these guys without crossing that line of there's certain things you never do you never humiliate them you don't want to you want to hang out with these guys but you don't want to owe them money so I've been asked, I've been doing a lot of press in, in the UK and I talk about the craze, you know. So it was the same, the Copacabana in New York. Yeah, you wanted to rub shoulders with the, the Rat Pack is there and the boxers and the mobsters. And in the, and, and in the UK, in London, it was the Cray Brothers, but you know, Sonny Liston, Frank Sinatra, they'd all be over there. And you want to be around this stuff because it's, you know, they're well-dressed, but you, you know, you kind of forget how, I mean, Boris is a very lethal guy. And you don't want to be on his bad side. But as long as you kind of know the code of conduct, you know the, the, the rules of the road, you can do it. But you don't want to get too close and you don't want to over overstep your boundaries. And, yeah. you know, that, that's when you get into some potentially dicey situations. And, you know, I don't want to get too, too ahead of ourselves, but just for the audience, kind of give, give them a, maybe like a palate pleaser in terms of, you know, Boris in Brighton Beach from the, you know, the mid seventies uh, through the new millennium, you know, they were rubbing elbows with quite a few uh, pretty serious, maybe more well-known notorious oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. New York criminals who you might, the audience I'm talking to, you might not have heard of Boris, but believe me, all these other guys that you have heard of, they knew who Boris was, and they respected him just as much as they respected anyone in, in their, uh, you know, in their orbit. Well, I won't go back as far as the Soviet times unless you want to, but he gets there in 79. By 1980, he's in Brighton Beach. The first thing he says is, I got to get a 38 caliber. He, he just forces his way into the network of the established crews. There was one from Leningrad, which they called Praterskis, because that's the old name, uh, St. Petersburg, and then Odeskis from Odessa. There's sort of two crews at that time. And he quickly established himself as a, he's a very, very intimidating guy. So he became a, a very feared enforcer for the established boss. But yeah, getting, uh, by the time they, they had this nightclub, sorry, this uh, country club, still there in Mill Basin called El Carib. And uh, it's, co it's owned technically by a man, man named Dr. Morton Levine, whose nephew is, Michael Cohen from Trump world fame. There is so <laughs> many connections uh, to, I mean, a guy like Boris loves Trump, but uh, he's doing a counterfeit deal with a guy named Shefirovsky. Shefirovsky later changed his name to Sater. So that's Felix Sater. A lot of these guys, uh, Ivan Kov, one of the most notorious thieves in law who was on the run and uh, they found him hiding in Trump Tower in the middle of Midtown Manhattan. A lot of these guys were super connected both to the 
powerful Cosa Nostra families. So Gaspard Queso, notorious guy from the Lucchese's, Francesi from the Colombos. I mean, every, every guy in the Italian world who was in the gasoline scam, which was Francesi told me for the book, and it, you know, I used it as a quote, this was the biggest thing for Cosa Nostra, gasoline tax, since prohibition, way bigger than drugs. We're talking a billion a year minimum uh, in, in theft. So yeah, they partnered with the Italian Cosa Nostra, but they all had a lot of connections to politics, a lot of connections. And some of these guys from Brighton Beach are back in Russia, Ukraine as oligarchs now. People ask me what happened to the Brighton Beach mob. I said, a lot of them went back and there's a few oligarchs who started off in Brighton Beach restaurants as busboys. I'm not kidding you. There's a, there's a guy worth 300 million right now in Ukraine who started off in one of Boris's kind of connected restaurants as just a waiter. <laughs> now he's in his mid thirties and he's a multi-billion, uh, sorry, multi, no, hundred by hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's a very high level of organized crime because it goes to politics and to establishment figures, hundred percent. One thing that Maybe, was, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was, well, was going to say, yeah. I mean, the, the Russian names by themselves may not ring a bell, but a lot of the people around uh, this orbit have been in the news lately. Yeah, yeah, that was something that was striking about your book. And if I can uh, rewind a little bit, one thing that was striking to me reading your book about Boris's background predating his arrival in New York, and um, when you're talking about his experiences in the Soviet Union as a, a kind of hooligan or bandit, um, yeah. one thing that was really striking to me, and I can't help it, I like to get academic, that's what I do, that's my day job, was really striking to me how many similarities there were to the underclass in the Soviet Union and the underclass here in the United States in the sense mm -hmm. of like, not very, like few economic opportunities, discrimination, and, they, and you end up hustling and then you get in trouble and you go to prison and, yeah. and it doesn't rehab, there's no rehabilitation. You just meet other prisoners and Boris comes out and he learns how to be a, an even better, not Everything. so much a hooligan, but, but now a gangster. And so I just saw so many parallels between this, what is what was a totalitarian system and then here you know it's a free society and it was i don't know it was very it did not make me feel good to think mm -hmm. about that well, there's so many parallels there yeah let me set the scene so so the word they've appropriated the word as far back as czar's times they took the irish irish english word hooligan and it's called it's pronounced hooligan and Boris was a hooligan. Now these are street gangs in the 60s, and uh, mostly in the mid 60s up to the 70s. Vladimir Putin proudly talks about having been the hooligan in, in Leningrad. He called it his university of the streets. And Putin was known for bees about five, six, 150. They said he fought dirty. He would, he would jump on the backs of bigger guys and start punching them in the face, claw out their hair. So this hooligan gang phenomenon, I viewed it, nobody really written this, but there were so many orphaned kids after the Great Patriotic War, which is what they call the uh, invasion of the Soviet Union. 20 million dead, but tens of millions of kids without parents. Or So Boris was one of them, ended up in a kind of orphanage. And then, you know, when those kids hit 15, 16, 17, they, a lot of them became street gang guys. Boris ends up going, like you said, to a, a work camp, a zona, uh, where they basically were counting the amount of calories they needed not to starve to death or freeze to death. He would joke, by the way, you know, everybody's heard the Russians say, your prisons are like country clubs. Well, Boris would say, no, in the Soviet zone that we got 350 calories, this, the weakest tea, this little porridge, you, you know, this is what you needed to have not to starve to death. We got to the American prisons. It was who controls the re remote control for the color TV? And are we having a, a chess tournament or a bocce ball today? Like he said, it's no comparison. But yeah, so and so he spent, I, I said this to a British reporter the other day, I said, 18 to 21. That's so formative for most young men. I mean, in Israel, 18 to 21 is when you serve in the army. 18 to 21, he spent it in a, in a brutal, brutal prison where they really were being marched, uh, you know, with, with guards, with rifles. And he said to me, I never knew a single person who came out a normal person again. Uh, and so, yeah, to, to get to your point, once you came out with a criminal record, I mean, socialist paradise, workers paradise, you had zero unemployment. So you had to go get a job or you'd be, you'd go back to prison literally for social parasite. That was a, a charge, so, social parasitism. Yeah. So in order not to go back to prison, he goes, you know, you go to the hiring plant and they'll say prison, 
okay, well, we'll have you like clean the toilets or, you know, shovel the snow. You couldn't then become an engineer. So yes, then they, he told me the only thing he did in prison was learn, how do you not, not leave fingerprints? How do you not leave witnesses? How do you do this? What's the, he said, I just learned how to be a better criminal. And there was no rehabilitation. And then after he became a criminal in America, I would ask him, did you ever think of stopping? He goes, no, I became a criminal so young, I can't change. <laughs> so even today, he tells me, Doug, it's not like I'm driving taxi over here. You know, I said, and he's in Moscow. I said, don't tell me what you're doing. If you don't want me to know, that's, I don't want to know. <laughs> but yeah, it becomes an unre un unrepentant, unrehabilitated criminal. Uh, in, 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 in part because of lack of opportunity, Scots, Jewish. I mean, people don't realize how restrictive it was for Jews in the Soviet Union. They weren't, they, only small numbers were allowed in universities. Um, there was official policies of anti-Semitism. So, I mean, they weren't being massacred en masse like they were by the Nazis, but it was not a happy life. So Boris oh, got no. out. Go ahead, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, so Bor Boris got out in that wave that a lot of your viewers will be too young to remember, but finally the U.S. through Scoop Jackson and Vanek, it was called the Jackson Vanek, put economic pressure on the Soviet Union, which started in the 70s. And then it became this wave from 71, 72. The high point was 79, because if you remember 1980, the Soviet Union got the Olympics and they were really trying to clean up their act. And the U.S. ended up boycotting the Olympics. But uh, Boris got out in 79 in that peak year of, of Soviet Jewish emigration. And they were just all trying to get out to have a, a half halfway decent life, you know, because they really didn't feel like they were free in the Soviet Union to be Jewish, to practice Judaism, to have legitimate economic opportunities. So, you know, the most dangerous gangster, I always say the most dangerous guy in any room is the guy with nothing to lose uh, or, or very little to lose. And I mean, the Jews in the Soviet Union had very little, they had very little to lose because they were they were low on the totem pole, let's say. Getting back to your gonna, so, social economic status, as you said. Sorry, I was just going to add that all four of my uh, great grandparents immigrated from Russia uh, in the early 20th century. So I trace my roots um, to the, same, the same place you yeah. guys do. Yeah. Um, and uh, some of them became a pretty uh, infamous uh, gangsters in Detroit. Um, the, wow. the Bernstein brothers, the Bernstein brothers wow. were the founders and leaders of the Purple Gang. Purple and, Gang is uh, scary bunch so, of guys, man. Yeah. I mean, they so were those were my uh, those are my great grandfather's first cousins and um, well, Russian Tov. Jews that, <laughs> that that's not a Mazel Tov. And, <laughs> yeah. So I just I, I can relate to a lot of this. Just it happened in another part of the country. Oh, by the way, I, I loved you know Boris and I were sitting uh, at Central Park. Couple, but it's right before the pandemic, and there's a great building, the Majestic on, on 72nd, frame, famously where, you know, Frank Costello got shot in the head by Chindy Gigante and he, you know, grazed his head. But but also Meyer Lansky lived up there. So I was looking, I was showing for us, you know, Meyer Lansky had a big apartment up there. But that always pissed me off that Jews are, are um, you know, American organized crime buffs like, oh, you know, Meyer Lansky, the accountant of the mob. I mean, go through the archives of the New York City like mugshots, and it wasn't just murder incorporated. There were so many Jewish hitmen, murderers. I mean, in the in the murder incorporated was, was a Jewish hit. Was well, Jewish it was Italian. It, it was Italians and Jews. But what I'm saying is, but we mostly, weren't just mostly the Jews. Yeah, and uh, a little digression here, but like when Lansky saw. Um, Every, you know, we're talking a bit about Jewish gangsters in addition. Boris is a Jewish gangster to me more than he is a Belarusian. But yeah, there's a famous story that Sidney Zion, a great columnist in New York, told me when um, uh, Meyer Lansky met up with, um, uh, who played uh, Hyman Roth in The Godfather? Uh, Strasburg. Uh, yeah, Lee Strasburg. Strasburg. Yeah, yeah. And he goes... You could have showed me. I am a grandfather of you. Could have showed me a little Italian, a little bit, a little bit of uh, um, that I was being outsmarted by the Italians. And then he told Sidney Zion, "Can you imagine a Jew being killed by a wop? I mean, like we're smarter than them." I was just like, "So this rivalry between the Jews and the Italians, like what? When did a Jewish gangster ever get whacked in Miami? Or I didn't get, you know." So this goes back and Boris to this day. He's like the Italians. Oh, they make me laugh with their mamma mia. The, uh, they, they work together and they hang out in prison in MCC. Boris would do time with the Italians. And, but there's always been this, you know, the, the Jews always felt they were just as tough as the Italians. So I want to dispel this notion that the Jews were just sort of like the, the money counters of the mob. Yeah. The Purple Gang were very feared, very feared guys. Uh, and Lansky, anyway. do, you, 
I just want to just piggyback off your point and let people let people know this. And and Ben, you can hit the siren here. Uh, Meyer Lansky had direct ties into the into the Bernstein's. My oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. my great my great aunt married Meyer's God uh, or my great uncle. My great aunt is Meyer's goddaughter. Um, so uh, lots of family photos from back. Well, in the one of the great years. things when they talk about Luciano's genius in creating modern organized crime, part of his genius was not discriminating against, like not keeping it clannish to the Sicilians and the, and the, and the Neapolitans. He said, we got great Jewish partners, let's work together. So Meyer Lansky, though not inducted into Cosa Nostra, was a very powerful associate. So this idea that you're on this, and the same thing happened in the 70s and 80s and 90s with the Soviet Jews and Cosa Nostra. They didn't take a back seat to them. They weren't the, I mean, guys like Francesi had testified and, and Gaspar Queso, oh, they were kind of afraid of us. Well, talk to Boris about that. Boris had a few sit downs with these Italian guys where he was like, you want to go to war? And I would say, Boris, why did he, why did they tell the guy like, to the a maid guy was kind of flexing with Boris in, in Bensonhurst and saying, you want to go, Boris says, you want to go to war? I said, well, why were you so fearless? He goes, because look at the Italians. They got kids in college. They got legitimate businesses. I'm a Russian. I got nothing to lose. I barely have a life here. I've only been here. I don't even speak the language. So I, I love the fact that the Jews and Italians have partnered together, but I also want to stand up for my Yiddish, uh, what we would say our, our uh, uh, I don't know, our uh, cojones would be the yeah. right, exactly. That Jews were not just the, the financial wizards. We were some, some, as were the Irish, every group has produced some lethal killers. And one of the brains in Brighton Beach was named Marat Balagula. Now he was more a brainy guy. He had an economics degree from Odessa. Boris was the muscle. And he was a, he was a smart guy for the muscle, but he was, a, he was the muscle. If he came with his gun and if he came with his knife or whatever it was, People paid. <laughs> His the usual point, thing. I wanted to make was that just going back five minutes was that Lansky, like you say, was no bean counter. I mean, Lansky oh. probably, if you got into his FBI records, and I've seen some of them, I don't have an exact number, but you know, they put hit the murder contracts that he put out on people. You're talking, you know, dozens if not hundreds of people that were For sure. murdered at the behest of, of Meyer Lansky. So he was, well, he was go read the, go read, by any, any stretch of the imagination. The, mo the most powerful labor racketeer in the history of the United States was Louis Lepke Bocalter. The right. only, only mob boss to ever get, uh, yeah, they got, they got the electric chair. Now, I will not give the spoiler because you guys haven't finished, but like at the end of the book, I talk about how Lepke, who was Lepke? Well, one of his, one of his siblings was an optometrist. The other was a pharmacist. One became a famous rabbi. Uh, the difference between the Jews and the Italians is there was generally one black sheep in the family who became a gangster and quite a few others who went on to like the traditional Jewish careers in medicine or law, whatever. But uh, Lepke personally killed people. Lepke personally, I mean, I think his first stint was like he was 13 or 14 years old for like shooting a cab driver who refused to pay the shakedown. So yeah, these guys, we, like any other group, we have our psychopaths, you know, we have our guys. I mean, there's a reason. I always love this when people say, oh, bugs, you know, bugsy. I mean, powerful guys in the underworld are often considered crazy. So the word bugs, bugs, Moran, back in those 20s, it just meant crazy as a bed bug. A crazy killer is a guy that you cannot, you know, you cannot hem him in. He might just shoot you for, for looking at him wrong. So, yeah, bugsy, crazy Bugsy Siegel. He liked to be called Benjamin, not Bugsy. He knew that was an insult. Crazy Joe Gallo. There's usually a crazy guy. Boris was probably called crazy. I don't know in Russian if he was actually called crazy, but he was usually that guy that anything could set him off and he would do it in a public place without consequences. Nearly slit a kid's throat in a public restaurant. I wrote about that in the book where just the kid insulted him and Boris grabbed the steak knife and was going to cut the kid's throat openly. And I said, you weren't worried about witnesses? He goes, no, but I was worried because at that time I did not understand that the state of California has death penalty. Also, I did not have the millions it would take to create a new identity. I was so young in America, I did not understand all the. I was like, not that it's wrong to kill a guy in public, but just you better know where it has the death penalty. You better know how long it takes to create fake passports and go on the run for 10 years. Not a guy that has a conscience about anything bad he ever did in his life, according to him, at least. He says, I feel no guilt. I would live it again. But, but yet he got tattooed on his stomach in giant Hebrew letters. God forgive me. So there's a cognitive dissonance for you. 
I said to him, you say you regret nothing. So why was it so important to get this tattoo that said Hashem, the late name of the Lord? Forgive me. So but some interesting uh, disconnects in what he says sometimes and what his actions are. So no, uh, what, anyway, yeah, was that was a huge digression from what no, we started. It, it, it's actually fine because you anticipated one of my one of my talking points. And, and Scott and I were texting last night, actually, about this very point something that was very striking to me and Scott, I mean, we were literally texting about this last night was how you really rooted this story within the, 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 uh, the uh, Boris's ethnic spiritual background, because you, we, we, we talk about the Italian mafia, the, the Italianness, for lack of a better term is really important to that narrative. And, and you see similar thing with Irish gangsters. But but I agree with you, at least I think this is what you're saying, and this is what I was texting Scott last night about, is that it seems like when they're talking about the Purple Gang or Bugsy Siegel or even the Russian mobsters, they'll say, yeah, they're, they're Jewish, but it's, it's just sort of like, um, they just happen to be Jewish, but they're just really gangsters. And, and I, I was really struck by how you had this like connective tissue, like, no, the, the, actually the fact that they're Jewish is an important part of the story Absolutely. and it's not like you're trying to be politically incorrect and say oh like you know all jews are gangsters or something like all italians are gangsters that's not the point but but you you don't necessarily want to detach the two things either <laughs> that they're well, part of the same story well one of the key things that i do have to say though and i felt a little bad because when i have written about jewish organized crime like israeli organized crime i wrote a series it ended up on like their stormer websites, you know, oh, like yeah. these neo because they're like, hey, even the Jews admit what great criminals they are, right? Yeah. But this is the truth, and Scott probably knows this, because life was so restrictive so many Jews, there was a lot of black market activity. They, they, they uh, estimate that by the 70s, when there were few true believers in the Soviet system, go look at old videos of like Brezhnev, he looked like a wax figure. Just, nobody really believed. The Communist Party officials were trying to line their pockets. You had Gazak Boris with his like no-show jobs. You had all sorts of black market factories. A lot of the Jews were involved in the black market. Flash forward to the oligarchs of today, Roman Abramovich. There's many of the guys, uh, Putin is many things. He's a gangster and he's a killer, but he's also not anti-Semitic. He has a lot of Jewish friends. And he made a lot of Jewish guys billionaires. A lot of them had their money in the black market. And it's not rocket science. When they took this entire state economy and privatized it, somebody had to have a little bit of capital if you were gonna suddenly like take over uh, the national gas pipelines or something. Who had money? It was officially a, a, a state without private property, private enterprise. A lot of the Jews were in the black market. It was a survival stratagem, but I mean, and that doesn't mean you're a violent criminal, but as Boris said to me, everybody hustled. Even his grandfather, who just was a, a cutter in a, in a garment, would steal, would steal a little bit of fabric on the side to stitch up clothing. So everybody from the Soviet era told me that was the norm. So it was a society that normalized criminal activity. So there's a, there was a joke that's not in the book. Somebody said, yeah, in the Soviet times, we would say, you're not stealing from your job. Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Every, everybody pilfered a little bit on the side just because it was, I couldn't believe how bad life was. Like I would talk to, I had a really good translator around my age and he would say, Doug, in Moscow, like we got one bath a week. I said, you gotta be kidding me. No, we got one bath a week and your mother would wash your clothes once a week. And I was like, huh? We didn't have deodorant. We had no idea, the idea how bad we smelled until we got to the West. But like, and there were just lines to get beef. I mean, life was crap. Life was shitty for most people. So you hustled, you did a little, you, if you wanted any kind of luxuries, any kind of Western things, you had to get it through illegal oh, means. Word. Yep. And, and almost everybody indulged in it. And the tribute flowed upward to the highest level, which was called the nomenclatura, which were the apparatchiks, the highest level, probably several million people in the Communist Party. They were the, the guys getting the richest. So all that black market and stuff flowed up to the top of the food chain, which was kind of a mafia family called the Commun Communist Party of the Soviet Union. <laughs> Speaking yeah. of or origins of organized crime. But yeah, but the Jewishness of these guys, one of the things I really liked about Boris well, I, I had to find a few things I liked was when he went and got a Star of David made. You know, I've got a little Star of David just for good luck. And he, he's, you can't buy religious ornaments in the Soviet time. So he has one made up and he's nobody. Nobody messed with Boris, but his friends would have Jewish faces. And there's a very offensive. Jid is the Polish word for Jew. Ivre is the he, is the Russian word. And he said, there, if a guy ever said Jidovskaya moral, that means like you have a kite's mug. 
horse would I just go beat him straight away like I would immediately so I kind of feel you know defender of the faith you know like I always respected a Jewish guy that was willing uh because that's that's such an offensive thing that my translator said yeah if somebody said Zhidovskaya Morda any Jew with any balls would have to defend himself like that's just so insulting it's like the n-word plus so the fact that Boris would fight for his friends and I kind of like that yeah protector I mean Flip side is that is that when you get to New York, they're shaking down the Jewish merchants more than anybody else, the Diamond District, which is, but that's, I mean, the Italians, the Sicilians, the Black Hand, they, most ethnic groups, once they come to the States, the easiest people to target are their own people, yeah. right? Well, I, do, they, I do these, these purple gang talks, you know, for the last 15 years, I do them pretty regularly. And a lot of them are for, for Jewish organizations. And one of the first things I have to do in, in the talk is like de-romanticize and say yeah. a lot, oh, they were they were protect, at least in terms, and I can't speak for what was going on in New York um, at that time, but in Detroit in the 20s and 30s when the Purple Gang was at their peak and they killed probably a thousand people in a 10 year period, 95% of those people were Jews. Yeah. And the, the, the street taxes they were extorting were from Jewish businesses. Of uh, they were not going into Italian, neighborhoods and and you know uh, um, jumping into into that uh you know in, into that fray and they were not pre preventing italians from necessarily coming yeah. in to there it was so they were preying well, on their own even and even I, more, I make that very clear when we talk about murder incorporated you know burton turkis the prosecutor wrote this book Murder incorporated that became a phrase you know, a lot of people now say it was more or less labor racketeering hits. Most of the victims were Jews. I think the final one were Kid Twist Relis, you know, the, the canary that sang but couldn't fly. He, uh, I think it was Leo Rosen. It was, it was, you know, there was these murders generally were because Glepke took over the garment district and the baking, all, all these industries that had been Jewish. And, and essentially, you don't pay. First, a Molotov cocked. Well, back then it was like acid in your face. In Boris's case, if they didn't want to pay, it was a Molotov cocktail. But it's 100% the same thing. Why? Because like the Diamond District, it's Yiddish-speaking, clannish, uh, Orthodox Jews. They're not going to go to the cops. Very rarely are they going to go to the cops. The Russian factories, now Russians love their smoked herring and all this stuff. So all these little factories and things. If you imagine people who came from the Soviet Union, where the police were the KGB, you did not trust the police. You hated the police. They come to America, they don't trust the police. So a guy like Boris and Boris's boss, Yvesi Agron, they come by and they say, you know, you want to keep your restaurant open, it's 30%. They're going to pay because they're not going to go to the cops. And if they didn't pay, a Molotov cocktail came through the window. And if that, if that didn't work, then something else happened. But it's it's just exactly the same as what happened throughout history. The Irish shook down the Irish, the Italians shook down the Italians, the Jews shook down the Jews. And, and rarely did they cross ethnic lines and go into the other neighborhood and shake. I mean, a Jew would not go. Uh, Boris actually was pissed off when this uh, uh, pro house of prostitution, they call them mamas, mamkas. They wanted Boris's protection. And, and the guy goes running to this Italian wise guy. And that's why Boris said, you want to go to war? He goes, did you ever see a Russian come to the Italian community and, and try to get into an Italian dispute? This is a Russian dispute, Jewish Russian dispute. Leave it between us, me and this Sasha. And like... Uh, yeah, it's not really keep it within your own little circle, right? The neighborhoods of New York make that very clear. Like this is a Jewish neighborhood, this is an Italian neighborhood. But you know, it's it, it's not something we should be proud of. But you know, there's been Ken's, Ken Burns documentary the last few nights about the U.S. and the Holocaust, and I have a lot of respect for Jews who fight. I do the Israeli military, the Israeli uh, commandos, and and so these these Jewish guys, they're they're fearless. The fact that they are willing to just take what's theirs. There's the downside to it is they're not nice law-abiding American citizens. And the characteristic of every gangster I've ever met, and I know some made guys in the times, it's wanting it now, not having delayed gratification, <laughs> feeling entitled to it. That crosses all ethnic lines, right? This this sort of narcissism of I'm gonna go take this now. I'm gonna, I deserve this. Whereas you know, Boris's brother worked his whole life at an honest job. Boris couldn't do that. He was too impatient. Couldn't drive a taxi. He got he, he couldn't clean toilets in the doctor's office. He wanted to be the big shot. So uh, it's it, all ethnic, all ethnic crime in the United States follows a similar pattern. But there are some distinctions with the Russians, which I'll get to. Um, 
after I, I let you guys ask some actual yeah, questions. I, I actually, wanted to, <laughs> you remind me of something else that, that I just loved in your book. There are these lighter moments. It's a very serious book, but there's some lighter moments. And when you talk about Boris and his fearlessness, it's not just gangster stuff. One of the things that I just loved in the book, and I can imagine this being on like a TV show or something, sort of like Sopranos-esque, but for the Russians, that he comes to the United States, he can't speak English, maybe a few words. He can't read the uh, the um, the signs, the traffic signs. The traffic signs, yeah. <laughs> but, he, but, he get, but he takes a job, or he, he, he uh, comes up with the scam so that he can get his taxi license. <laughs> and he's, yeah. he's driving a taxi, and he has no idea where he's going. The only place he can get to is Long Island. So every person that gets to the cab, take me to Kennedy Airport, he takes him to Long Island. Take me to the Bronx, he takes him to Long Island. <laughs> all he could do was follow the picture. He could not read a word of it. All he could do was find, follow the pictures of the airplane. And I mean, this is the thing. You could buy a taxi license. You could buy anything. You could buy a graduate. I mean, there was so much criminal activity in Brave Beach. You could buy a graduate degree for a few hundred dollars. It was it was hilarious. Yeah, and I, I, I there was there was intentional humor. I I put some things in that book that I thought it just sounded hilarious to me. Like you're, you're actually trying to drive a taxi without knowing. Um, in New York and that lasted City. about a week. Yeah, in New York City. But Ru that was the thing I was gonna make. Russians, I mean, but remember, he's from Belarus. He was going like 5,000 miles off to Siberia to do these jobs. Um, he was living above the North Pole briefly, you know, like, or not above the North Pole, sorry, above the Arctic Circle in Norilsk, in a, in a town built on the Gulag. Because of the environment that they came from, once they got to the West, if you notice, he's in Sierra Leone, he's going to Bangkok to get heroin. They are, I hate to say this because it kind of fits into a Jewish stereotype that Jews are kind of, we were stateless people according to Hitler, but we're glad and global, like Jews will go, like we travel the world. Anywhere there were Jews, I would ask him, why were you in Antwerp? Well, that's the biggest diamond quarter in the entire world. Wherever there's Jews, there's diamonds. By the way, so people understand, why are Jews with diamonds? Whenever we were being, our Scott and I both know this, our families were like victims of pogroms. You needed portable wealth. You couldn't have your wealth in land. We often were, so diamonds were a great way to have it gold. So uh, anywhere there were diamond merchants, great place to shake down, great way to do heists. Uh, so they were in Antwerp. Then he ends up in Sierra Leone. Well, why Sierra Leone? Well, that's where they're mining the diamonds. So everywhere. But I actually thought there's not many ethnic groups that would just go off like Boris is patrolling this this deep rainforest with a machine gun to make sure that the alluvial miners aren't stealing the diamonds. And I thought, you Soviet Jews are pretty freaking fearless guys, you know, like you'll go anywhere in the world, right? And, well, they, and they also they, they didn't have a problem just jumping on airplanes even when he didn't have a green card and going back to Europe to do heists, going to Israel to do a diamond heist, they just got on planes and went whatever they thought there was a job. I don't know if it was the conditions of the Soviet Union that made them that fearless or that reckless, but yeah, I've seen Boris do stuff that I just thought was nuts. Like, I mean, you don't know what you're doing. Like, why would you do this? But he just, he just launches right in. And even to this day, when I talk to him on WhatsApp, he'll say, dog, I must go tomorrow to Kazakhstan and then to Siberia. And I'm just like, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Providing protection, I'm not sure what it is, but don't tell me over WhatsApp, whatever it is. I know they're listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, that was another part that I, <laughs> so I'm reading the book and he's a, this tough Russian mobster. He spent time in a Soviet prison system. So this guy's a tough motherfucker. And the one time I'm like, Boris, are you insane? Is when is when I'm reading your book and it says now he goes to Sierra Leone. That was the one part where I'm like, Boris, no, no, that's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've, and you've it, gone too far. <laughs> and the insane. reason it happened was because he got shot with an Uzi, and they were and he knew who did it. And he wanted to kill the guy personally. Now, two very notorious killers, the Gemini twins. You know, if people have read Murder, that's a very popular book, uh, Murder Machine. So the two two of the guys who were the hitmen. Uh, ended up settling this this dispute, and Boris was so mad. That was my revenge. I wanted to kill this guy. He knew who shot him, but so the police are pressuring him. We knew who shot you, Boris. So first, Boris goes off to Miami Beach to get laid. I'm like, okay. I was just shot with a newsie. I don't think the first thing I'm doing is going to look to like have a nice weekend in Miami. But he says, you know. I, and then the next thing was Marat says, better we get you out of the country until this all dies down. I've got a diamond mine in in Sierra Leone. It just yeah, it was insane. But many of the things he told me were insane. Like he gets out of the Russian zone and now you're still until 27 required to go into the Soviet army. So he's decided just so I'm not giving away too much. Boris was a sportsman. He started off as a wrestler, a boxer, and then he became a rower. 
And if you, if anything you could do for the Soviet Union that could win you medals in the Olympics, you, you would then go, you know, like the Red Army hockey team, or you were, it was a high status thing for the Soviets to win Olympic medals. So Boris was on a, he had the master of sports classification. He said, I figured I'm going to go to the Soviet Army and I'll just compete. And, you know, these were guys that wore uniforms, but they didn't have to actually go to, you know, and he, anyway, he does his three years and he comes out and he goes, there's no way I'm serving in the fucking Red Army. But, but while I was in the zone, I found a book on psychology and everybody said the best article to get out was Article 7B, psychopathy. So I studied up all the symptoms. And when I came before the army shrink, I, I put on all the symptoms of a psychopath. And I said, OK. And then he, he says, the guy says, uh, the shrink, we can't let a person like you carry a gun. You're a psychopath. And then I wanted to say, of course, the more probable explanation. But my editor said, you don't know probable, just say possible. I said, OK, the most po most possible explanation is that the psychiatrist just said disconnect from mother and father at early age in prison by 18 psychopathy diagnosis, no serving in army. But um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times he would tell me these stories and I would say, I like your spin on that, but I'm going to kind of tell the reader what I think is going on here. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that in your book, you sort of you, the way you frame it is you're, you're trying to be fair, but you're also like. I, my takeaway was like, but you're also like, but then again, it just could be that you were a psychopath. <laughs> and right. that's well, what I was about to say. that you are a psychopath. Well, I didn't want to, you know, you know what, the two, the, the two books that really influenced me the most were Pelegi's Wise Guy. And then I went back before that to Peter Mouse's Falachi papers, which very few people read anymore. But just long sections of those, of those books, you're just allowing the guy to tell his story. Partly because it's so fra it's so immediate. But the other thing I realized, too, is that the more I put it into the third person and I interpret it and all this. What, somebody told me this. No Russian guy of this level has ever really talked to a reporter at this length. So I thought coming from the horse's mouth and these are all professionally translated right down to the the idioms that Russians use. I tried to get it very faithful. So I love the way if you go back and read the Valachi papers, it's not read much anymore. He just he, he lets Joe Valachi because this is the first guy that a made guy has ever said. No, he was a low level guy, but he thought v Vito Genovese was going to whack him. So he says, OK. And I think Peter Moss was a reporter for the Saturday Evening Post and got access to him. And then he realized. Hey, I mean, so Valachi was sitting there writing this kind of incoherent autobiography. Peter Moss shaped it into a narrative, but he will occasionally come in and say, Valachi's version differs from the police reports. He doesn't do much more than that because I think, I don't know, I hate when authors pontificate or preach to you. I like it. I assume most readers are smart enough to read between the lines. And when Boris says something that sounds far-fetched or self-serving or like narcissistic spin, they'll figure it out without me saying, hey, you know, wink, wink. But yeah, I, I tried, by the way, I tried quite a bit of un, unambiguously funny moments because you had to lighten the, uh, some, by the way, some I left out because it just sounded, um, I was sitting with Boris and he told me, Doug, you know, in time of Gulag, so when Boris was born, his father was in a Gulag. These were brutal places in the Far East. When Stalin died, they did away with the Gulag system. There still are work camps, but they're not called Gulags. But he said, Doug, you know, in the time of the Gulag, if two men are going to break out, they must take one of the newest prisoners who still has some fat on him. Like a, a, a guy might be a little bit, you know, meat on his bones. I said, why? He goes, it's, it could be 5,000 kilometers to nearest civilization. So you might have to eat him. And he tells me this with a straight face. And I, and I thought, what a bullshit. I said, such a bull. That's the single but, greatest anecdote I think I've ever heard. But, but listen, I, I, I tell this to a guy from Russia and I said, Boris told me this joke or what? he goes, that's not a joke. We used to say it. It was a saying, like if two guys break out of the gulag, they take one of the newest guys who's not starving to death because, you know, I mean, the distances, just look at the map from some of those places. It really is endless tundra, endless tundra um, to the next civilization. So, I mean, I, maybe at some point in the 40s, somebody did it and killed somebody. But anyway, it's an expression people use. And I was like, OK, you guys are a hardened kind of criminal that I, I've i never heard somebody say, yeah, you break out of Clinton down tomorrow. You got to take the fat guy so you can eat him on. <laughs> very, very, very. Um, it's a different level of savagery that they grew up with, I would say, <laughs> in the Soviet times. I mean, life was cheap. I mean, Stalin killed tens of millions. Of, I mean, Hitler killed tens of millions. Stalin killed tens of millions. Life was practically worthless if you, and especially what Boris said to me after he got out of the zone, is that, you you know, if, if you can't get a normal job, I mean, then you're, 
at any point, once he started stealing from the state, it really was, I mean, the, the article was, I forget what it was about, but uh, it was a supreme measure of punishment. They would threaten you with the firing squad. And that's not for violent crime. It was just having too much cash that you couldn't prove you earned. Boom. You know, summary hearing in front of the, the military court, firing squad. So that's when he told me he had to emigrate. It was like, I felt the pinch was closing in. It was a matter of a matter of months, maybe months, maybe a year before I, I faced the firing squad. I had a few friends. I mean, we don't have many guys facing the firing squad in the United States, you know. So that's the other thing, too, is that the risks and the consequences for these guys are just a different level, you know. And, and one thing I want to make a, a clear to your readers, I, and I, I hope you know, if we get this series off the ground, because I said this, this, there's always ethnic crime waves, right? There always are. I mean, you'll have people coming from Vietnam, you know, anywhere that there's Albanians, like in New York, a lot of the little Italy of, I, I've been living near, uh, you know, Belmont, Arthur Avenue. A lot of that's been taken over by Albanians. Just look at the map. Albania is the poorest country in Europe. So they're hungrier than the Italians. They, they're, they're more willing to, to do, you know, have illegal card games and risk, risk things. But Boris and his generation were the first crime wave in American history, I think, where the guys came over violent sometimes with extensive criminal records but also with university degrees like you say i've grown boris's boss had a degree from the university of Leningrad. marat Bologula had a degree from the university of odessa in, in economics and i said i can't think of another ethnic crime wave and these were not like white collar criminals these guys were violent that had a higher <laughs> standard of higher education it certainly wasn't true for the sicilians who came over the black hand it certainly let meyer lansky and those guys they were just escaping the shtetl so I mean, this was a very unique and it will never happen again because it required the collapse of this vast failing nation, the Soviet Union, which educated a lot of its people, but also created endemic criminality. So as a period piece, I think it's a, and as a criminologist, I think this is a really fascinating moment in American history when a bunch of guys came over who were deadly, savage, willing to use all brute force and, and murder but also had read Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and understood economic theory. <laughs> it's yeah, one of the reasons- It's a perfect storm. Right. It's a perfect storm, right. And it's one of the reasons that when the gasoline tax, if you guys want to get into that at some point, that was one of the greatest rackets. The feds, like Francesi told me, because I talked to Michael quite a bit, if people know Michael Francesi's channel, he said, Doug, I had a, I had a dealership in Long Island of uh, Mazda, and they knew he was stealing. I think he said his operation, he said, my guys, my Russians would bring me 10 to 12 million cash weekly. Two million went to Junior Persico, his boss, the snake. <laughs> and he said, but he said, Doug, by the way, two million in cash a week to your boss buys a lot of loyalty. So he just factored out, he said, so that was my operation was hundreds of millions. And I'm just one guy. So it's billions. He said the FBI came to his master dealership and said, how are you doing it, Michael? We're going to give you a pass. Like, just, we don't understand how you're doing it. And he said, yeah, right, you're going to give me a pass. Guys, I can put you in a new Mazda. Go, he said they got so mad. But for 10 years, the feds couldn't figure out. It was a series of daisy chains. And Francesi, I told somebody about this the other day. I said, yeah, Michael Francesi was a very smart guy. He actually went to St. John's. But I said, he told me he had 18 offshore companies in Panama, various things. I don't hear of Italian-American organized crime doing that much. That was the Russian guys with him who were already thinking globally, who were thinking of all kinds of money laundering scams, but it was such a complex daisy chain. Yeah, it took some guys who understood economics, who understood what the, what the Soviet Jews saw very quickly to survive were chinks in institutional uh, armor. So the Russians are still pulling scams with Medicaid, Medicare, anything they see that's a weakness in the system. That's how they got over in the Soviet Union. And they simply applied it to the US where it's kind of gratuitous because you can make an honest living in the US. But yeah, all sorts of hustles, anything that they see that's kind of bureaucratic where something can slip between the, you know, what they exploited in the gasoline tax was this change in the law which required the gas to be picked. The tax was supposed to be paid once a year. So all they basically had to do is create a series of movements of cash on paper, which never happened. And when the tax man came once a year, oh, it's a non-existent company or it's an empty office. <laughs> yeah, it's not that co complicated, but the way they made it look and the, the paper trails really were hard for the IRS and people to figure out how was it working. Yeah, we, we taught, we've had uh, shameless self-promotion. We, we've had Michael on the show before and he, he spent a little time talking about this and, uh, he even said, mentioned the Russians. That was one of the reasons why he felt that 
even his own father, not just Persico, started to uh, turn on him was uh, they felt that he was getting too powerful, not only accumulating so much money, but that uh, Michael was 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 starting to really like hang with the Russians a lot, some tough Russian he, dudes, and they were they were afraid like that Michael was going to try and take over uh, the family <laughs> back by back by the Russians. He told me he would go on Thursdays to Brighton Beach. I think it's in the book. He said, "Oh man," and they had this you know supper clubs. The Russian supper clubs they're crazy. It's like it was. Th- I said I called it in the book. Uh, it was a fever dream of Western opulence as filtered through a Slavic sensibility. It's like chandeliers and velvet and like Vegas showgirls, like just for a regular dinner. They just, it took it over the top. So he said, yeah, they have these huge spreads with lobster. They love their lobster and their caviar. So he'd go out there Thursday, do his networking. What, like Boris will say, no, Francisi and the, it was a, it was a guy named uh, Iarello. It was an Italian guy that came to him because there'd been gas bootlegging had existed for a long time. Carlo Gambino was even involved in gasoline voucher scams in World War II. That existed. But what the what happened was uh, Markowitz, who was a Bulgarian, Persitz, three guys came to Francesi and they said, let's explode this. So Francesi offered them the protection. Boris told me, frankly, he said, yeah, we knew how to do it. The Russians knew how to do it. But the Italians had a lot of gas stations. They had all the unions. They had the waterfront. They had a lot of connections in the police. So it was kind of a joint venture. But what the Russians, I think the Italians would have done it on a small scale. And what the Soviet Jewish brain brought was just exploding it in. Like Boris said, our innovation was to take a guy from Eastern Europe and actually have him as the front man in the company. So he's a real guy. This wasn't a paper company. Real guy. But then when the tax men came, give him 100 grand US, which was a fortune. Just go back to Poland. Just go back. And then they could never be subpoenaed. They'll never be caught. That was a pretty good innovation, by the way. Like, let's we'll have a real person from the Eastern Bloc be the be the front man in our little business here. And when the feds come looking for you, because the weak link of any scam like that is someone's going to talk, right? That ended up happening to uh, Michael's, Michael went away, who, he was offering protection to Markowitz. And Markowitz was killed in his Rolls Royce in Brooklyn, like it was a famous assassination. He, and partly because he was giving some testimony or it, rumors were he was talking to a grand jury. Boom, boom, boom. But uh, yeah, what what's fascinating also is that so I have this Soviet emigre um, educational level, but then communism collapses. So then you had these waves of killers for hire. Yes, over in the Soviet Union or the former Soviet Union, there were a lot of top thieves in law gangsters getting assassinated by snipers, trained snipers. But you also have a few cases, they're in the book, of these special forces guys who had been in Chechnya, they're broke, fly them over to Brooklyn, 150,000 to do the hit, boom, then fly back to Russia. So they're, by communism fell in 91, or, or sorry, the Soviet Union broke into 15 republics in 1991. You started to have a lot of killers for hire coming over. Again, perfect business plan. Bring a guy from Russia, doesn't speak English, tell him who to kill. He's on the next flight back to St. Petersburg. Who are the, who's the FBI going to talk to? So it's very, 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 very clever people. <laughs> yeah. It's a very clever group of organized crime. Very, very clever and not afraid. A, a very good FBI, sorry, FBI task force, uh, NYPD uh, detective first grade named Richie Fagan. He told me, Doug, he was, he was at a unit called OSID, Organized Crime Investigation Division. He said, we work, we try to work the Russians. Problem with the Russians is they would kill your whole family. Like if they, back in 89, 90, if they thought you were talking, it wasn't like they'd kill your, you'd kill you in the street. They'd kill your whole family. So it was so hard to get cooperating witnesses. That broke down a bit, but early on, it was so hard for law enforcement to penetrate because you had, you had the, the mobster himself, like Boris, I don't give a shit. I'll go to jail for five years. I don't, it's, it's nothing. Like I get TV and I great meals and I get to play bocce ball. And, and yet if he talked, well, your family might get killed. So they were, they, they posed a real threat. I quoted quite a bit in the book, 1996, uh, the Senate had a hearing with, you know, Senator McCain and Cohen, the threat of Russian organized crime in the United States. They had to have Senate hearings into this because they couldn't figure out how to combat it because the, the conventional methods didn't really work with these guys. Take yeah, that for what it is. One thing that, that reminds me of what would have made it so difficult, maybe you could comment on this, something I'm really interested in, I think Scott is too, the, the sociology of organized crime is, so if like with the Italians, 
if you're a made guy, right, there's there's some status there, and that, that matters in terms of underworld politics. But with the Russians, and I, I'm ignorant about this, so I want to see what you think, but reading your book, I think of like the, the thieves in law. I'm thinking of those as like the, the made guys, but 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 it seems like things were fluid. Like you had guys like Boris and, and other real heavy hitters in, in Brighton Beach that weren't thieves in law, but they would Absolutely. they would they would work with thieves in law. And so how did how did that work? Because it seems like the thieves in law. I don't know how to pronounce the, the word in Russia. Is it uh, Vori? Vori, Vori Yeah. And, and, they, okay. they had status, but but they weren't. But they didn't necessarily call the shots. Can you explain that? Well, how? okay. So going back a bit, Vori Zakoni, it, it goes back before Stalinist times. Thieves are, I hate that, so I laughed about this with somebody, thieves in law, it sounds like your mother-in-law. Let's say they're called thieves within a code or legalized thieves. They absolutely are like made guys, you're right, in that they have a code. You cannot work an honest job. You cannot serve in the Soviet army. You cannot have a relative who's in the police. Uh, you're not even supposed to get married, not supposed to sell drugs. So they have all these restrictive codes and they settle all disputes in prison. In prison, they run everything. Out in the streets of Russia, they do too. What happened was, so Yevse Agron, who became the first boss in Brighton Beach, he was a thief in law, which means he had been inducted into this elite society, but he lost, it's, you're crowned because you're kind of a king. He lost his crown. I think I call that chapter the uncrowned king. Another thing you can never do in the code of the thieves in law, in their code, was lose at gambling and not pay your debt. It's called being a fuflizhnik, a deadbeat. So he, he gambled in one in one illegal game in Leningrad and they lent him the money to pay it back. And then, you know, he was addicted to gambling. He blew it again. And they said, you say you gambled and you didn't pay your debt. We took away your, your crown. But you say, uh, Boris told me, didn't matter. When, when you say came here, the fact that he didn't have a crown, he put together a tough crew. He had a lot more power. There were two or three real thieves in law in, in the US, but they didn't have his cunning. So the rules didn't apply in the US. Getting back to the made guy thing doesn't exist in Russian organized crime uh, there because you have to view it this way. The Sicilians and the, I guess, and the Camorra, they came up with these kind of military structure, uh, whether it goes back to uh, Masseria, I don't, I don't know when they really started to use these terms, uh, soldati, capo regime, you know, going up to a boss and, and, and capo and all that. But they filmed that, they formed that as a hierarchy. Boris said to me, they would laugh when they call, he said, when we would read these articles calling you say the Godfather, he said, we only heard about the Godfather in the movies. We don't use that word. We have this word star she leader. And after the leader of the crew, everybody's equal. The other thing that gives them a lot of power is the guy who is powerful is the guy that's bringing in the most money. And Boris said, what, what they also found funny about the Italians was these families and these ranks because if Boris wants to do a job with, with this guy, Moni Elson, or he's free to go do a job with a different crew and put together, it was like kind of job to job. It is organized in terms of some code of conduct. And what, what Boris told me is the thieves in law, back, so the Vodis Akoni back in the Soviet times, would settle all disputes on a criminal level. So if two guys came, before, and this happened quite a bit in Brighton Beach, where you almost have them as a judge. Hey, look, this, this happens with Boris. <laughs> Boris had this guy get sent to LA to steal count to steal paintings. Um, an antiques dealer said, "I want the I don't know. Maybe, let's say they were Van Gogh paintings. They're like multi million dollar paintings. Well, they break into the apartment. They leave no fingerprints. They get bring them back, and the guy says, "What are you trying to pull a fast one? These are these are counterfeits. These aren't real." And they said, "It's not my job. Like, it's not it's not my problem." Because oil means like you you, you know, son of a bitch. It's not my problem that they were. So they bring it to you say, and you say says, "Well, look, you sent them on the job." They didn't know if they were real or counterfeit. You still must pay them what you promised to pay them. So that's the role of the kind of thief in law or the leader is to keep some structure so that things just don't turn into all hell by, you know, my word versus yours. So I would call those guys criminal authorities. They're, they're more like judges and criminal authorities. And below that, every guy's free to move. I would say it's like a bunch of amoebas, you know, amorphously moving together, coming together for a job, moving None of that structure. It doesn't have the hierarchy of the of the Soviet Union's. Sorry, of, of the Cosa Nostra, and um, you know that's a weakness. But it makes it very hard for law enforcement to figure who do you take out, right. because clearly when the when U.S. law enforcement wants to go after the mob, they don't want an associate. They want a guy who's on the chart. They want a made guy. 
and they want that made guy to talk. And and once you had, um, well, Sammy the Bull, but also quite a few. I mean, it's gone up to uh, uh, my guy. My guy flipped. My guy flipped, before, my guy flipped before Sammy the Bull. Well, who was that? Uh, Leonetti in eighty nine. Sammy flipped in ninety. Ninety, and, and the guy that influenced Sammy to flip, he's in the book. I can't. A little, little Al Darko. Uh, Al but Darko. once you, had, yeah, yeah, a little Al Darko. Uh, yeah, but then you got Joe, Joey the Cena. Like you got a boss willing to talk. I mean, I don't know who a boss can give up that the feds don't already, don't already want. But yeah, I mean, Metalli, Ralph Metalli was the first boss to flip. He flipped in ninety nine, but he that's kind of there's like an asterisk there because he wasn't right. really the boss at that point. Uh, but Messino was obviously the the biggest American mobster to ever. Flip, right. And, and that was in 03. So and here's the other thing. There's no Omerta in Russian organized crime. So it's there. Like Boris talked. Bor Boris, his arch enemy, Monia, they all give up something to just get out of prison. And it's I know it's not La Mort Omerta because Boris went right back to Brighton Beach to be a, a, a gangster. He, he It's not. They figured out the American system. They figured out, give them some information that they need. So you don't do 30 years, 40, especially if Boris was busted for heroin trafficking. He's not gonna do 30 years. So he gives up information on Monia's operation. They're just conniving, man. They're just, Boris is a really good chess player, by the way. They they, they figured it out. They, they understand if nobody else is gonna sit there and do 30 years, why should I? So there's no Omerta and you don't get killed for having talked to the feds. But in the old system, that old system that you hear about that uh, Galotti's book about the Vodi, that's so old fashioned. Th those guys are not. Um, but having said that, so if people have seen the, the very famous prison tattoos, it's your whole story. You, the two stars are, are signs that you were inducted as, as a member of, uh, you know, the thieves in law. There was a, a, a filmmaker who wants to make this documentary on my book said, you know, Doug, it's funny I because I asked Boris, so Boris, what if you put a scorpion? What if you put something on you that you didn't earn? He goes, oh, well, I mean, you die. You can't do that. And this guy told me, you know, about five years ago in the suburb of Moscow, they found there were a bunch of young guys, punk, young punks, that were showing up murdered in the trunks of cars. I mean, they couldn't figure it out. And then they realized they had put the stars on themselves just to flex and try to get into nightclubs. <laughs> and the thieves in law found out that these guys had put those stars and they got boom, boom, boom. So on that level, like you don't see a Russian with those tattoos that tell his whole story. That's not taken casually. So the Russian criminal society is very deep, but it has none of the hierarchical structure or strict codes like the. I, I like that about the Sicilians, but has anybody really kept it? I mean, it, it hasn't held up. Omerta didn't hold up. <laughs> guys. When I wrote books about Italian organized crime, I would talk to, uh, I wrote this book, one of my first books, so it's called Takedown. And it was about the, how the Gambinos and the Genovese ran the garbage rackets of New York for 50 years, going right up. So Jimmy Brown, Fiello was a captain. But it was funny, I, I would talk to these law enforcement guys who specialized in mafia. And they said, Doug, get over that shit about having a button. Like there's, there's guys who have a button and are broke. Then you got associates like Angelo Ponti there are associates who are so much more powerful than made guys because of the money they bring in. So like what a famous story, John Gotti, uh, in one of the last commission meetings, John Gotti wanted to tell Chin and he was afraid of Chin. He told us, tell Chin, and you know, I straightened my son out and Chin says, I'm very sorry for you. Meaning you put your son on a freaking chart for the FBI. Chin's sons were involved, Esposito and uh, the guys on the waterfront. He never had them made because they could make a lot of money Trust me, nobody messed with them because they knew they were Chin's son. So it's, it's the savvy behind it, right? So, you know, you figure out it's always a cat and mouse game between organized crime and law enforcement. I think law enforcement has a little bit of an edge usually, but it really depends on how, how ruthless they're willing to be. What would you I mean, this is... This has gone all, all, way off the. I'm very digressive. I'm sorry, but this no, has sorry, gone sorry. off your original. But yeah. just so people know, there is. I would actually go to, as far as to say there is no Russian mafia. That's okay. just a term that was about. There are Russian speaking organized crime groups. I mean, I actually wanted to say what the FBI calls it Sov, Soviet emigre crime, and it's largely Jewish. 
Well, they wanted the word Russian mob in the subtitle. I was like, yeah, that, that, that doesn't ring too, too mellifluously. Soviet emigrate crime in America. Sounds like a, tr- a treatise, treatise for a, a PhD thesis. People like those words, Russian mob. But the Russian mafia as a, it's not a mafia the way that the Sicilians or the Camorra or the Dagada, those, those are mafias like systems. It, it's Russian, Russian organized crime is much more fluid. It, I don't want to say it's not organized because it is organized, but it's just much more fluid. Yeah, there's some there's some uh, great stuff in the book where we, about the um, them interacting with the with the Italians and uh, I mean this comes right out of the Godfather. There's a moment in your book where I think Boris he basically says, you know, I like the Italians. I work with them. I you know eat eat dinner with them, whatever. But I never trusted them. <laughs> it reminded me of like I, it's my opinion. I never trust. Well, because because he had a guy, so he had a guy that owed the money, and and Boris didn't want to kill the guy. He just wanted the money paid back. Actually, he didn't owe Boris money. Boris Boris's crew they were known for money extraction jobs, and they would take fifty. It was it's so many funny lines in the book. The guy was coming to him and say, Boris, you know, Capusto owes us a million dollars. What do you want from me? We're not the Red Cross. You know, like we're we're going to take half. You know, this is not a charity operation. So if they extract the money, they get a, they get half. But uh, yeah, so this this guy came. He was Russian. Uh, he owed Boris is chasing him all over Brooklyn. <laughs> he guy's getting away, flying backwards in traffic. And then these two wise guys who are, I think, with gas pipe. Yeah, they were with gas pipe. But gas pipe case. It was a ser- he was even feared among like he was just a serial killer. And he died of COVID during the I think doing doing five hundred years because he broke. He had a witness protection deal, but he broke every rule of it. Just a total psychopath. And um, these guys come to Boris and say. Don't kill him, Boris. Boris says, why would I kill him? I need the money. He goes, okay, well, we're doing the job for him. So it was a, it was a what are they talking about? A bust out. They, they had him as a head of a company. They were going to run out the, the insurance and do everything. Just a Russian guy to be the front of the company. And Boris is waiting. He gives him the word. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll come get the money when you're done with him. And then one day he reads in the paper. He goes, he's found in a trunk in Manhattan Beach, near Brighton Beach. And, it, and he used this Russian expression, the more has done his duty, the more can go, which is from Othello. And I mean, Russian is a very literary language, so I had to keep that in there. He said, you really said the more has done his duty, the more can go. And he said, after this, I never trust Italians because they promised me I would get my money. But I'm sure the, the Italians don't trust Russians either. Because, I, um, yeah, I'd like that to be a big thing if we do this documentary of just showing it's this because it's kind of all macho flexing. I'm sure neither one of them want to go to war with each other. The Italians have a more disciplined military structure, but I would say the Russians are crazier. And I mean, I think David Chase got it pretty right in that Pine Barrens episode, which oh, everybody yeah. loves them. I mean, <laughs> you know, this guy this guy had been special forces in Chechnya, and Polly Walnuts goes, he'd been with the interior, <laughs> interior, interior ministry in Chechnya, and Tony's trying to tell him on a breaking phone, he goes, I guess he was an interior de- decorator in Czechoslovakia. And, uh, <laughs> And Chris says, his apartment looked like shit. His apartment looked like shit. But I mean, I mean, that showed two wise guys who had no clue how to, they're running around in their, in their Bruno Maglia shoes in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. And they got a guy who's been a Chechen special forces guy who's not afraid to freaking live in the forest and kill them. That's not inaccurate. That's not inaccurate. They got that right. But he was also accurate in showing that Boris would come to this guy and say, Launder this money for me because Boris has told me there's so many complex ways that the Russians launder their money. I mean, it's beyond offshore. I mean, the major Russian oil company, the second biggest oil company in Russia, Luke Oil, has, I think, 200 uh, commercial stations in the Northeast US, Luke Oil. I've been told it's a money laundering front. I mean, I can't prove it, but that, that it's just a venture for money laundering. It's so complex how the Russians uh, and the oligarchs have figured out how to launder their money that it, I'm sure that Italians have come to them and said, you got better ways than us. Figure it. Show me your Panama companies. I'd like to ask Michael Francesi if I talk to him again, where did you get all these Panama company ideas? Because I'm pretty sure he got it from Markowitz and some of these, these Soviet emigrants that had already been doing it with other. Um, they are very, very good at scams. They are the ultimate guys with scams. And I mean, and some are basic, like pickpocketing i mean this is this gets into the sociological stuff i always wondered you know if you think about a pickpocket to us it's like you know the romani people it's like it's so low level like a pickpocket right but in the soviet union there was no credit cards there was no assets in the bank you just had cash so the master thieves were the guys that could figure out a way they would cut your like he told me his his boss if was a writer 
I said, what do you mean he's a writer? Well, he could take a coin or a, he could cut your pant leg with a, it's called writing letters and steal your money. Well, okay, so now you bring that skill to the US, they would go, well, they called it Smenka, which is a quick switch. You got a, you got a diamond that, that's really worth 30 or $60,000. You go down to the diamond district, you have a cubic zirconium that looks exactly the same. You let the diamond dealer appraise it, look at it under the thing, and then you do this quick switch, which only a pickpocket or a magician can do. And you've kept your diamond and you've gotten $60,000 for a piece of worthless glass or whatever, zirconium. So all those hustles and schemes and scams, I don't know. I, don't, I think the Russians figured it out better than anybody else because they were used to scamming each other in the Soviet Union, by the way. Like everybody was ripping off everybody. It was just a, it's a way of doing business. No, I, I, I noticed that. I noticed that in your book, like even with some of the, the Russian guys uh, were scamming each other. And then, and a lot of the times Boris had to be the guy who steps in and picks a side and says, okay, <laughs> like you got to cut that shit out. But, but they, even the, the, the Russian gangsters were, were, were trying to oh, run scams on each other. Re remember when he gets scammed at the beginning of the book, you couldn't, you couldn't take any money. So Boris had made maybe the equivalent, like he was an underground millionaire, but all his money was in black cash. He had, you couldn't take anything with you out of the Soviet Union. So we bought a couple of small diamonds and then he gets duped into buying, his sister-in-law tells me, uh, yeah, it was called, it's called the Blue, Mar Blue Mauritius. It really is the, I mean, it's worth millions of dollars. It's one of the rarest postage stamps in the world. So the only way foreign things would come into the Soviet Union was through Odessa. Odessa was called Mama Odessa because merchant marines used to come through there. So Boris hears this legend, you know, someone comes and says, I've got this blue Mauritius. It is worth like hundreds of thousands of dollars once you get to Austria. Well, of course it's a counterfeit. So anyway, I looked at Boris and I was kind of like, what are you jacking the beanstalk? Like you traded everything, you know, you traded everything for, and his sister-in-law said, yes, there were 12, 12 of them in the world and Boris bought the 13th, you know, like he put everything into this, but, and I was like, who would rip off Boris? But the thing was when the Soviet Jews were leaving, nobody knew communism was going to fall. It, everybody was looking for a way to hustle these people before they left because they thought they're never going to come back. You're, you're never going to see me again. So even if you were afraid of a guy like Boris, you try to rip him off. And then once he gets to Brighton Beach, Everybody was ripping off everybody, but as Boris pr proved by sticking his gun in a guy's mouth, it's like, you just had to show that you weren't the guy to get, it's called a loch, a sucker. Everybody was looking for a sucker and it was very cutthroat. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a fascinating, um, a fascinating world. And I, I, I encourage uh, our readers to, uh, to check out, to check out the book. We're, we're, we're going to have to start wrapping up now, even though there, there were about a million other things I wanted to get to and, Poor Bernie didn't say much. I'm sorry, Scott. I kind of stole the. I kind of, no, I, I kind of took all Scott. That <laughs> Scott. Really I mean, I, I I hate for the model, but I mean, I I kind of know what people usually want to hear about this world. So even though you may have had other questions, but I mean, the the idea of what made this group special? Why did they want to do this stuff? Uh, no, but a, this is what I. This is what this is like. Going back to what, kind of what you said about some of uh, your favorite kind of writing, and I've kind of learned about it in my writing as well as doing this podcast. Sometimes you just got to shut up and get out of the way <laughs> and just, you know, let the person that you're interviewing or let the person you're writing the book um, with just do their thing. And you did your thing for, you know, more than we could have ever asked. And I, I thought that every, I mean, every ounce of what you, what, uh, what you gave the audience uh, has value and insight. And uh, I loved it. This, this episode exceeded, well exceeded my expectations in terms of, uh, what we were going to learn and and being able to chop it up with someone as um, really as as accomplished as, as you are. Well, thank yeah, you guys. Yeah. I mean, my my feeling about it is uh, just keep it entertaining. You know, I mean, when I've done a lot of podcasts and radio interviews, I mean, you just don't want dead air. You want to you want to keep the 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 information going and the storytelling going. It's it's a very very interesting complex world. I, I encourage people to check it out. It's it's different from what you would expect from a typical crime book because these are it's 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 a bit sociological i'd say in places where i really kind of get into well what was the soviet union i tried not to go too heavy on that but you know you still got your shoot 'em ups and your and your your what you expect from a true crime book but um yeah respect to you guys i mean all all gangster stories to me are inherently fascinating because we somebody asked me like why do you think we're just attracted to these gangster books and i just said well give you for instance well, there's that great scene in The Sopranos where, remember, um, 
Artie is sitting there and there's a guy, he's checking out the competition, he's with Tony, and there's some kid sitting with a baseball hat. And he goes, as this really burns my ass. Fine dining establishment. Tony goes, you're not at a ball game. Take your hat off. I will not. Tony just looks at him. Every guy wants to kind of do that, right? And then the girlfriend looks and says, hey, and he goes, how you doing? You know, everybody kind of wants that moment in their life. But then the flip side is when Francesi says to me, my Russians would breed me, okay, well, some weeks 15, some weeks five, but on average, eight to 10 million cash. Give two million to my boss. Who doesn't fantasize in our straight lives, our regular law-abiding square lives of having like 10 million to pay your college tuition for your kid, to pay off your more, like it's just this, ah, what would I do with, it's like a lottery every week. So we fantasize about it, but we don't want to do it. Nobody wants to go to jail. So there's this inherent mystique to organized crime because I don't know. It does, it's not like we're, we're talking about thugs and rapists. And we're talking about guys that still wear nice suits and you want to be around them. God, I wish I had a, a couple of Russians showing up with shopping bags of $10 million. Man, I'd have a great life. Yeah. yeah but I, I'd have the feds talking to me every week too, though. So No, I, 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 I hear, I know, like my students, I teach crime classes and my students, um, especially the female students, is kind of an interesting thing. I don't know what's going on there, but they're, they're obsessed with serial <laughs> killers. They always want to oh, talk wow. about serial killers. And I'm always like, what what's wrong with gangsters? Can't we just go back to can't we just go back to gangsters? Like, yeah, I'm not like I obviously I study violent crime, but I, I keep it within the realm of gangs and organized crime. That that's not my thing, like the the serial killers and things like that. So yeah, that I find that, that to me. It's creepy to me. I find that, yeah. I the sexual serial killers like Bundy and those guys are just I mean, I can't turn away when I start reading about it, but it's it's disturbing in a different level because I really do think with these guys. It is it, a lot of times it is just business. I got I got to whack this guy a bit. I don't dislike him. I'm, Boris, I, there's a radio host in New York. I couldn't. I didn't even know this for the book. Boris was contracted. We had coffee in New Jersey, and I'd heard the story. Save a Kaplan. He had the biggest radio uh, Russian language radio show in New York. But they met because Boris was contracted to kill him by his competition. And I said recently, yeah, in the '90s it was very common for Russian business disputes to be killed, uh, settled with contract murder. But anyway, he couldn't catch up with him because it was before cell phones. He'd be getting like pages by the time he got to Rasputin. So save it, two Jewish guys, Boris is the hunter and he's the, and then we're having coffee and we're all sitting down together. And I said, is it really too Boris? You said, when you finally met him eight years later, when you got out of prison, you said, you're such a nice guy, Sieva. I couldn't have lived with my conscience if I'd killed you. Did you really say that? And he goes, yes, I said it, but also the guy who ordered contract was already dead. So who's going to pay me? Like, it makes no sense. I don't dislike the guy. <laughs> it's very it was, transactional. <laughs> it was so transactional. It was so, like, we've all heard the Godfather. It's, this is, this, this guy's taking it very personal. This is business. It really was. They're great friends to this day. And I said, I can't believe. But he's, or Boris also looked at me and said, Seve is a very lucky guy. Because several times I caught him, but too many witnesses knew me and stuff. I said, wow. The, I mean, this is the stuff that people like to hear. To me, it's like you like to hear about this stuff because you really aren't killing for or doing something because you hate the guy. It's, it's business. And that's a very strange phenomenon to settle your business disputes with a bullet to the back of the head. So No, I, I, I agree. And and so our, our listeners, if they don't already, if they aren't already reading Doug's book, uh, you want to plug your website so they can find out. You've, sure. you've, you've published some things with Ice-T, uh, wrote a book yeah. about Chapo, and we, we want to have you back on again. But, but oh, I could talk. Uh, tell this, us where okay, this is, this, this, the, these are the two latest. Uh, one is called Split Decision. They're both about crime. One is a cautionary tale about Ice-T and his best friend who went to prison for a murder, a robbery that went bad and became a murder. <laughs> Uh, they're both, my my name is up there spelled correctly, douglascentury.com. It's all one word. Or just Google Douglas Century. Um, I appreciate, and I've got email. If anybody has questions that I didn't answer, they want to hit me up. They want to threaten me or whatever it may be. But Vladimir Putin's people have been calling me lately. So, um, yeah, check out the, the website. All my books should be up there. And I've covered the waterfront. I've written about outlaw bikers, Jamaican posses. I'm looking for another ethnic group now, but I just don't, um, you know. We're running out of ethnicities here. I don't know about you guys. Uh, your content was like the Russians. There's so stay, many. Hey, Doug, stay on when we're done. I want to talk to you about something off air. Okay, and for I'll sure. Build, thank you guys. I'll inform, I'll inform you for something you just said about. Okay. Well, thank you guys for having me on. And yeah, please check out the website. And I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, DouglasCentury.com. Feel free to hit me up. And I'm I'm open to answering questions and, and de debating and whatever else. Yeah. Well, thank you, Doug. And thanks, everyone, for watching and listening. Uh, please follow us on social media as well. We have our YouTube channel up now, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Please follow us. Please spread the word. Please uh, read Doug's books. 
And uh, I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, Scott Bernstein. Scott Bernstein. We're out. <laughs>